Hello and welcome to another Eurolurgan podcast. I'm Donald McCone. And I'm Michael Scott. Hello. And we're indoors today. Uh, it's sunny outside, but in about 30 seconds. You just know how the weather's been over the last couple of days and this weekend has been oh, horrendous. It's also been a bit windy outside as well, so we, we thought would, you know, would, our sound uh, would appreciate or take more benefit from being inside. So. Well, you could always say something defamatory and then you could pretend the wind blocked out the speech, but we don't do that sort of thing. No, never. We would never be defamatory. Never. Never, never. So uh, <clears throat> we've got lots of stuff to look at this week and... I know it keeps recurring, we come back to a subject that seems to be lingering on, but we've got a almost like an exclusive that uh, we have to report on that we've been covering this week. Yeah, on Thursday we were contacted by a nurse at Craig Alvin Hospital um, who told us the hospital was bursting up the seams, um, her exact words, um, due to the fact that there were basically too many patients. Um, if you, I'm just trying to find her quote here, it doesn't matter if you're a cardiac or Stroke patient, you'll be waiting hours, is what she said. Um, and that's the, the, the sort of surgery that's instantaneously required. You, yeah. Having been there myself, Michael, that, that instantaneous support at that particular point is yeah. crucial. Mm -hmm. um, she also said that ambulances were backed up outside the A&E. Um, so it seems as though there's a bit of a backlog in terms of getting pa patients out of the hospital. Um, you know, patients who are maybe ready to go, but just can't get out. So we contacted the Southern Trust to see what was going on, what they uh, were doing about the whole situation. Um, and their comment was basically, it's not, also I should say as well, not just uh, Craig Avon, which has been affected by this, but also Daisy Hill uh, was the same. The nurse was fit to tell us Daisy Hill Hospital in Uri was the exact same. Um, so the Trust, they said that their hospitals were working beyond capacity and that many patients were waiting a very long time in the emergency departments to be admitted to a ward, uh, and that the <clears throat> excuse me, the trust was facing facing ongoing challenges in admitting patients and managing these pressures is a huge daisy daily challenge for our exhausted staff. So, so for me, that tells me two things. Number one, the hospital is struggling to cope with the number of people here. The, the, in there's the, no denial about about what the nurse oh, has been saying, the, and they have been very upfront in terms of what they are saying. And number two, the poor staff are absolutely wrecked. So. You know, obviously, you can't point the finger of blame at them. It's just the way things are at the minute. Pete, they're, they're, just, they're just struggling it, really, it's, really badly. It's starting to become uh, the story <clears throat> that's been the case in Southern Ireland over quite a number of years where there are trolleys in areas where you're not supposed to have people be, normally. Uh, they're over uh, overburdened with people coming in, not enough staff. So it's, it's, it's that sort of scenario. Was there any mention of uh, the uh, latter effects of uh, COVID and, and what that has done to services? That wasn't, no. they weren't looking for reasons <clears throat> for or, or any sort of uh, no, what, hiding behind something or anything? Not what, really. What they said was that most of the long waits in the ED are due to patients waiting for a bed to become available following another person's discharge. So it's getting the patients back out, which is proving to be the problem. Um, so that's having a uh, an impact on the, the amount of time that new patients um, are having to spend in the ED before they go on to a ward. Um, so the trust say that it's vital that patients leave hospital as immediately when medically fit, um, either by first accept, accepting the first placement that becomes available to them, including the patient's own home. Uh, and the trust are, and staff are doing everything they can to try and move and treat everyone and as quickly as possible and make everybody as comfortable as possible. They also say that um, people, the public, if you're thinking of coming to the emergency department, phone first. There's a special number which I'll give you. Um, 0300 123 311. Uh, so if you're thinking of coming to the hospital before 9pm, phone that number first to see whether or not you should come to the hospital. Um, you might be as well going to the likes of um, the Isle of Ours, perhaps even going to um, South, South Tyrone, where they have the um, Minor Injuries Unit, that's what that's called, um, which is actually very, very good down there. It's a really, really good service. Uh, I know it's a bit out of the road from here, but so, it's really, really good down there. So what's not to say that the similar problems are, perhaps you have been aware, you're, you're out finding out, 
is this exactly the problem in every area, every trust throughout the country? Well, that's what the trust said. This is um, they're suffering the same problems as every other hospital in Northern Ireland. This is a province-wide problem, but we're starting to. Well, I say we're starting to. I think this has been going on for a while uh, in Craigavon, but um, it's the not it's probably one of the first times that a nurse has directly contacted ourselves to say, "Look, we are really struggling here." She actually feared that a major incident was going to be called, which could be, you know, a big moment. But as far as we were at this stage at the time of recording anyway, no major incident was called. So hands are tied with the, the trusts in that they have only so many physical resources and also longer term uh, the opportunity to increase those uh, facilities. So we're caught in this for a, for a bit of a while, particularly during the winter, when there are increases it's in, in all sorts of going to be a very difficult winter for the health trusts, you'd imagine, in the hospitals. For a start, there's not enough nurses from what we hear. Um, there's not enough beds, obviously, as well. Um, people um, are going to feel the, the impact, I'd imagine. We hear this all the time now in the news. People are going to be seriously sick because of what's going on with the cost of living. People are making choices about whether or not they eat their homes. Uh, and that's going to lead to people, you know, being sick due to just having really serious colds and stuff like that there. So it, it's, it's, it's a worrying time. It really it's is. a worrying time. I wonder, there's very little that you or I can say that can uh, abate this situation other than perhaps this is a time to when you look into your neighbour or you can help your neighbour or vice versa. And it's tough for everybody, mm -hmm. absolutely everybody. Um, so how you can pool resources or how you can just share yourself with somebody else even that personal contact makes a change uh, with the, your attitude and all sorts of stuff it isn't solving everything it's not going to keep you extra warm but there's a sense of community that can be built at these times absolutely and you know we hear a lot particularly in the winter about isolation and people feeling isolated and people a couple of people who will go into their homes uh, at the start of the winter and we might not see them again until the end of the winter it's basically that, hibernation. That, that could happen, hibernation, they go in the hibernation. Yeah. And that's awful, I think. You know, I think we should all rally around each other and um, give each other the strength to go on. We'll be reflecting on some of the circumstances and, the, and the, the things that are out there to help over the coming weeks, if at all possible, or if you have a few suggestions that you might want to pass on to us that we can cover and then relate to other people that might help in that kind of sharing and understanding and helping. So please reach out to us at info at your .com. Absolutely. Uh, moving on, um, the bin row rumbles on. Um, obviously, most people now will have had their bin emptied, or at least one of their bins emptied. I had my black bin emptied on Wednesday, which was a fantastic day. Um, all the better for it. All the better for it. Fewer flies around the house, fantastic. I still have a few myself as well, as well as everybody else. The cold is going to catch them too, hopefully. But <clears> anyway, the problem is still there, you're saying? it's Well, not so much still there. It was discussed at uh, Monday night's council meeting, last Monday night's council meeting, um, sort of the fallout of what happened. Um, one of the things that was discussed was the possibility of the black bin bags. So obviously, we were all told you're not the, the bin men would not be lifting additional black bags beyond what was inside your bin. So there was a request from Alderman Stephen Moutre um, that all properties with black or blue bins were entitled to or should be entitled to have two additional black bin bags collected for two bin cycles, basically to get rid of all that rubbish that's been gathered at home. Um, however, the Lord Mayor, Councillor Paul Greenfield, same party, DUP, advised that under standing orders, any proposals that commit the council to expenditure cannot be taken in the any other business section of the meeting and advice will be taken to the committee for further exploration. So basically on a technicality it wasn't passed. It wasn't passed and then there was accusations then uh, later on that um, it was disingenuous to make this proposal. Uh, that came from Alderman Jim Spears of the UUP. Um, he said, I want to see the place cleaned up and I don't suspect there's anyone here that does not. But I am not so sure that if the proposal was put forward last week, sorry, that I'm not so sure if the proposal that was put forward last week would have reached a conclusion as yet, and we would still have a strike in our hands. He's talking about the DUP, obviously voting against the deal. In any event, I'm happy that it goes to the committee, 
but I do think it a bit disingenuous to have a proposal of that nature, bearing in mind what was said last week. So, uh, and then... So there was inter-party uh, rivalry and all sorts of stuff here. Yeah. Are you, are you I, suggesting that the councillor said it just to be seen to be looking after people, realising that this might have been the case, he wasn't able to get it through, or is that...? I'm not suggesting that, Donna, no, no, but there are... Um, that might be what was being suggested by others. Um, but it's, it's going to be looked at anyway at committee level. Um, then there was an another row, obviously, since that meeting was held, Almost very quickly, we found out what the result was. The meeting, if you recall, was held in committee, which meant, if you recall what I said in the podcast last week, um, I was sitting ready to watch the meeting. The meeting then went off because they went in the committee, which means that it was held in private, so they could discuss the details of the deal. Um, and then they came back and said, right, well, that's it. So, but very quickly after that, the meeting finished, we knew what had happened. Um, and there were statements out from political parties very, very quickly. So we had um, a number of councillors, unionist councillors, Jim Spears, who I've mentioned there, and um, also Alderman Mark Baxter uh, of the DUP, very critical that there had been leaks of what had been said in um, the, the private meeting. So they want, want to make sure that confidential meetings are kept confidential. Um, Alderman Spears actually said that he had had a verbatim report of what had been said in the meeting. So that was interesting to see that um, they were concerned that this had been happening. In fact, um, there's uh, Alderman Baxter actually said, do you think leaking out a statement before council business is even completed is going to garner, sorry, he was making the point that there's an election coming up. Um, or, well, it looks as if there's an election coming up. Can't wait for that, by the way, Donna. <laughs> what be? Um, it basically said it was politically immature in the extreme to be making these announcements um, or making these statements uh, and then finally the other thing that came out of the meeting as well a bit of a row um, about some comments that have been made by um, Lurgan Alliance councillor Peter Lavery um, let's see I'm trying to read this here for you uh, the group leader of the DUP again Alderman Mark Baxter um, told an Alliance Party councillor that his politically immature comments could see him refer to the local government's commissioner for standards um, and that warning came after the Lurgan councillor had claimed uh, that strike action would still be ongoing if it was up to DUP councillors. Um, now, this came about because um, another DUP councillor, Lavelle McGrath, had suggested that, or had asked officers to investigate claims that he had heard over the weekend that some council staff had been knocking off early. Um, uh, he, he said he wasn't sure if it was under task and finish, but what what is certainly something that has been brought to his attention, and something that I feel is concerning, and I want to ask the officers to look at this. Um, so, uh, Jonathan Hayes, who is the interim director of Neighbourhood Services, the man who looks after your bins, he said that uh, staff are not working the task and finish, and have been working the hours they are due to work. Uh, there are a number of matters we can update committee on next week, this coming week, um, but the vast majority of staff are all working their contracted hours. Um, so Councillor McArath had, pre had said Look, well done to the staff for doing so well but I've heard this um, so that was described by the SDLP group leader um, Councillor Thomas O'Hanlon as being a slap on the back followed by a dig in the ribs quite like that um, uh, it was at this point Councillor Pete, or Peter Lavery said I want to put on record our thanks but it is unfortunate that these unsubstantiated remarks have been made staff have been working hard they have been working hard to clear up the DUP's mess. The fact is the mess would still be ongoing and the strike action would be ongoing if it was up to the DUP's councillors and I would ask them to reflect on that. And of course that was said in open meeting. I was said in the open meeting. Okay. So then the, um, the Lord Mayor then said Councillor Lavery may be asked to clarify these remarks by Alderman Baxter uh, branded them pathetic, childish, childish, sorry, politically immature and incorrect in the extreme. Um... If people that had the time and effort, maybe we could go to the Northern Ireland Local Government Commissioner for Standards, because again, these comments have breached the councillor's code of conduct. Um, and he also went on to say that it makes him look like a fool. So, anyway, 
Chrysler's are still uh, arguing away like, there over it, the bins. It sounds to me this is better than the soap operas that everybody watches on their TV. You get to watch the councils. I used to go to council meetings elsewhere in a different <coughs> jurisdiction many years ago, in fact, many centuries ago. And there were stories within stories. You had to know the personalities. You had to know the parties and all the rest of it. But somewhere in the middle of that, there's meat and gravy for us to eat and, if not enjoy, kind of get an understanding of how a council works to some degree and how a council shouldn't work sometimes to, to a different degree. It's one of the great things that we do. On You're going to have to give full credit to the local democracy service. Um, obviously, we're a very small team, so we rely on a thing called the local democracy service. Just to explain to people, it's funded by the BBC, essentially. It was set up by them, but it's... It's a service that they, uh, journalists are employed by different um, companies, media outlets, um, and we then, or they then form out their, the work they do, and the likes of ourselves can pick that up. Now, a lot of the, comment, or the coverage you will see on, on the council might appear elsewhere as well, but it gives you know, people out there a really good insight as to what's going on in the council, because they do, we will have coverage then of all the committee meetings that happened, um, all the full council meetings that happened, and things that maybe we just wouldn't have time normally, you know, as a three or four man band to go and do. So it's really good service, and you know, full marks to Adam for getting those stories. They're brilliant. Well it, it's, it's called transparency too, it is. isn't it? And it's very important. You know, and, and that's why we cover the courts as well. You know, um, you know, they're a matter of public record. You know, no matter whether you like it or not, that's what they are. They're the bread and butter of local news and, you know, we're going to keep on covering them because it's, it's very important and people need to know what's going on out there. Uh, I'm sure you have your thoughts on them too. When the stories go up there, I do see postings of people on our Facebook in particular. If you want to get in touch a little deeper, uh, feel free to. Info with your .com. So We'll move on. We'll talk about your day out yesterday. Yeah. Or sorry, not yesterday. What day was it? Well, it was uh, during the week. Yeah, th Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, I got a, an invitation to uh, the Clan Iron, or Clan Gale, sorry. They, there's so Ooh. many clubs now. Oh, don't worry, they have open days too and friendly days. This was the Clan Iron Wellbeing Group's friendly day. Clan Gale. Clan Gale. It's a good job, he's here. When you read the minutes in the public transfer, you will realise I made the mistake. Clan Gale Wellbeing Club friendly day we got it right that time i hope so um, <laughs> anyway yeah, I, I mean mcgovern invited me and i went down it was very interesting it looked like it was very interesting i've watched your video um it was um you got a wee pack as well i did i've got some of the safety measures that you use if you're going to use on the internet i got a i got a cloth to clean my glasses i must go and use it uh, and, and a few other devices one was particularly good where you can actually put your um your card, your bank card, whatever, into this little pouch, and so that when you're carrying it around, you won't, they won't be able to steal the details from you. I actually, wife, I have so. a wallet that has been specifically designed for that purpose. Wow, it's uh, they're quite expensive. My sister in law bought me it for must, Christmas. Must be a big one, keep all the spiders in for all the because they've been there a long time, oh, it's a long time since you've opened it. Oh, well, hang on, I bought you coffee the whole week, <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway, don't, moving don't, on, don't let's look at Donna's on. video while he's. Absolutely. Talking nonsense. Thank you. He's all very welcome here today. Um, I want to introduce Billy from the PTSP. Um, he's trying to give his all the way back to take home with his today. Um, there's loads of fantastic stuff in it. He's going through all that and done that. Um, Eileen McGivern. I am on the wellbeing committee here at Clan Gale. Um, we formed um, about five years ago. Um, there's a group of us um, at Clan Gale who volunteer to do um, wellbeing initiatives based on the Healthy Club project, which is run through Crow Park. I'm here in a Verve capacity as well as being on the wellbeing. Um, the Verve fund Clan Gale as one of our Verve centres, and one of the initiatives is the Friendly Club, which is an older people's group that meet on a Thursday morning, um, usually term time. I've developed a plan so that there's something different each week that they're coming to hear, do or listen to. Um, and this week we had Billy from PCSP doing a scam awareness and home safety talk. Um, and they've got a wee pack home with them with loads of stuff in it that they can sit down later on and read and see how they can make their home more safe. You will get phone calls up the loop as if they're coming from a local number. And indeed, some of the criminals will actually use telephone numbers that are for 
GP surgeries? And indeed, we may well be seeing uh, one of the gentlemen in that uh, later in uh, next week or early next week. There's a new initiative coming out from ABC Council uh, on their kind of joined up writing uh, campaign for uh, the older members of our community, the 50 plus, they're building a strategy. So look out for uh, for Billy, who was in our previous uh, piece there. Uh, he'll be turning up during the week as well. Look out for that. Let's move on into the world of sport. The world of sport. The world a busy, of sport. busy weekend. Of no Dickie Davis here, just us two. No, two. no, B busy weekend, not of sport, but of talking about sport and all sorts of stuff. And more to come this week. Mm. Yeah. Well, we'll start off with, the, with um, Gaelic. What's been happening in the Gaelic scene, Donald? Well, there hasn't been too much. It hasn't been too much actually in games. Um, I mean, the game, big game last weekend uh, was uh, Clannern winning uh, the semi final of their ladies uh, senior football championship. They're now into the final, and they I think will play Carrickrop, and we're looking forward to a preview of that in the coming week. Uh, so that was happening at the weekend. Uh, of course, I was down at uh, Clan Gales uh, well being event. But it's been mostly uh, kind of building up for another kind of uh, cup weekend or two that are coming up. That's been happening. And of course, the ladies themselves had a big, big night of, uh, a big, big day, actually, of uh, women's football or mother's football. If you were a mother, you were taking part in this. Oh, get for mothers and others. Yeah, that's the one. And they had loads of people turning up at it. Uh, and I was at a presentation, as you know, on the Friday night. I will give you an insert into that. You'll get looking at it later in the week. So that was a bit of a night in Eroog, uh, just on the uh, edge of Lurgan, as it were. So we've just seen in the check here, £630 raised for, for this day for yourselves. I think it's a similar event to, to all the people. Yeah. How important is an event like this and realisation and raising of funds for you? It's very important because it costs Mary Curie £20 an hour to put a nurse into someone's home at night and we used to we try to cover any patient who wants to die at home and the nurses go in at 11 o'clock at night and stay until 7 the following morning Indeed, the reports are, are, are fabulous for yeah. yourself and similar organisations that do this yeah. the work is really hard for the for the for nurses the, yeah. involved It is, it's it is, and uh, but most of the reports that we get back are fantastic about the help that they give, and uh, you know, very often the patients are reluctant to discuss things with the immediate family, whereas during the night there, if they're on their own with uh, a nurse, they will talk about things that they're concerned about. So it gives them an opportunity, almost like respite for them from, yep. from the family. Well, thank you very much, okay. and thank well you. done. And there are other things happening, of course, in Gaelic games. Eugene Craney is the man to look out for, for Eugene Craney reports. He'll keep you up to date. He will. He kept us up to date, actually, during the week. He had a breaking story. Um, Absolutely, yes. I was sitting during the week. Uh, I was on a, a tour of Lurgan. I was phoned to you for a coffee. You weren't about. Yes, yes. And um, I, I was at another occasion where I was going to buy you coffee. Darn See, the wallet was out that day and you missed it. Yeah. Anyway. Well, uh, still in the wallet, folks. Dermot Morrison has resigned... Um, from his post, so that was a bit of a shock as well. The legendary Dermot Marsh, and you can't use the, the Dermot Marsh name without putting legendary before it. He was an all Ar all Ireland winning minor footballer. Uh, he was a uh, part of the McCrory Cups, all Ireland, so if not successful, certainly up there with success then. Before he came to the senior Armagh team, pretty good with Clannagale. But he was stupendous for Armagh and in that 2002 year of winning the All-Ireland, he was a supreme contributor to that and continued for a number of years. Of course, he's gone into the um, to work for the Ulster GAA since then, That's of right, course. Yeah. What a character. Lovely man, a very gentle man. And he managed, as you were you're saying, um, Clan of Gale for the last four years. They were pipped at the post in this year's quarterfinals. He just couldn't get over the line, beaten by a single point, which was very devastating. But as they do in the best places, he's been there for four years himself and uh, Joe Lavery. Joe, a great character too. His sons play for the team. Uh, and I think that both of them have opted out. Certainly Dermot Mar Martin has anyway. Mm -hmm. Who will replace them? We'll have to ask Eugene. Well, Eugene will find out very quickly. Um, football. Now, you may notice that I'm sitting here and I'm currently... 
uh, in a state of neither happiness or sadness. That's because I'm trying to contain myself. Just, um, we were recording this on hours, literally hours before Glen Avon play poured it down in the first Mid Ulster derby of the season. The rest of 2022 could be ruined um, by this result tonight. Um, just to let you all know, I mean, forget about your cost of living crisis. It all comes down to who wins the Mid Ulster derby tonight. Of which you'll hear a report within seconds. Hi everyone. Um, as you can see, we're not at Shamrock Park because. Um, well, let's be honest, Ethan. Whenever I was leaving the ground last night, was do you think Daddy was happy or cross? Why? Cross. And why do you think Daddy was cross? Because the football lost. Well, they didn't lose. They drew one each, didn't they? Yeah. But they weren't very good. Sure, we weren't. No. You watched the first half at home with Mummy, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And what did you think? Porterdown lose. No, Porterdown didn't lose. Porterdown drew with Glen Avon, but Porterdown are rubbish, yeah. aren't they? Porterdown are rubbish. And Glenavon couldn't beat them, could they? Yeah. No. So the game started. Portadown. Mm, Portadown got an early penalty. Uh, handball by Mark Hockey. <laughs> it was a handball by Mark Hockey. Uh, Jordan Jenkins, who played for Glenavon, stepped up and took the penalty. Uh, but Rory Brown, the goalkeeper, made the save, didn't he? Did you yeah. see that? Was a good save. Yeah. Uh, then. There was a bit of a scuffle um, a short time afterwards and Portadown really should have been down to 10 men when Shea Connolly should have been sent off for a bit of a scrap. Well, not really a scrap. He held down um, Michael O'Connor. Um, and like O'Connor couldn't get up. To me, it was a red card. What do you think? Yeah? Yeah. Um, uh, so, Glavin did get back on level terms. Um free kick came in and it was headed in by Hockey. They put it back to one each. But to be honest with you, the performance was not great. Glenavon didn't play well. Um, my highlight of the day was getting out of the ground. So um, um, I think I just needed to calm down before I came and did this video to tell you all about the match. And hopefully Ethan um, has cheered you all up with his funny faces. What do you think? Um, um, next week... Glen Avon played on Gannon Swifts. Um, I'll not be at it to be upset. So um, that's good news for me. Back to Donna and me in the studio. So bye. Bye. So because that happened after you recorded it and before we put this out, you won't know what your reaction will be. So look at his face. He doesn't know if it's gone the right way or the wrong way, but he'll reflect on it. I really, really, really hope it goes the right way because if it doesn't, Anyway, uh, the only other thing I want to mention as well in terms of sport is the world of bowls. The world of everything, right? Bowls. <laughs> um, I'm not. Well, of course, we had Dara Toman, but he's not in Gaelic. Dara Toman won that uh, Irish national championship he was in for in his uh, in his kind of field of martial arts. Remember Dara? Dara? Is it Dara? Dara Toman we had on a few weeks ago. Oh yes. And he won the Irish Championship. Yeah. Well done. We're gonna we're gonna get an, an interview with him. It's going to be next week. That's right. But, uh, um, no bowls. For about bowls, yes. Um, we've had a couple of reports. You'll see over the coming days on your Lurgan, uh, in our sports section, and uh, they've had a really good. It's all coming the end of their season. They've come to a really good conclusion. Some trophy wins, um, but you'll be able to write, read all about those uh, on our section as well. And they'll hopefully have an end of season roundup for us as well. The bowlers have been very good contributors to your Lurgan. We're happy to have the reports. And if only there were others like them. If your club would like to have themselves mentioned in your Lurgan, sport at yourlurgan.com. We would love to hear from you. Really we, would. we would particularly love to have reports from uh, our local golf clubs, of which there are a couple, uh, particularly Lurgan Golf Club, because they've had a good bit of success during mm. the year, knocking on the door of, of, of trophies and all sorts of things. But just in general. Yeah, junior sports clubs or junior football. Um, uh, send us your reports would love to, even if it's just a few lines you don't have to write that an essay just let us know how you're getting on lovely that's it, it then that's a wrap yeah that's it I'm going to pour it down now um, I'll take a bath afterwards obviously because it's stinging weather we <laughs> <laughs> Oh, heaven forbid. If you're listening in Portadown, that bit got lost in the wind. If I had the wings of a sparrow. Can't sing that song. No, I don't think so. Uh, anyway, yes, uh, send us off there, Donald. Yeah, just about to. Uh, wish you the best of luck. Looking forward to seeing you back in the future. 
earlier in the podcast as regards to the result. Mm -hmm. So if you've come to the end of the podcast and you've missed that bit, you'll zip, zip, zip back to that part where Michael tells us and gives us the report on the Portadown versus Glenavon clash, because it's in Portadown, isn't it? It is, yeah. it is. And Are you going to watch it? It's on TV. Well, I, I have a, another commitment, right. but Lucky I you. could be back. Yeah, possibly. Uh, thank you for watching, <laughs> listening to... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching, listening to this podcast. Some of it makes sense, only the bit at the very end. Thank you for listening. I'm Donald McCool. And I'm completely baffled by what that's all about. I'm Michael Scott. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye.